can you even imagine? Can you imagine being Tim Cook in that moment? The level of impossibility in front of you. The responsibility that now sits on your shoulders. Listen, there's no way around it. Steve Jobs made Apple. But Tim Cook made Apple the most successful company in the world. Here's how he did it. There was the question. Steve was a visionary. Can Tim continue the Apple tradition of creating? Can he reach into the future? Did that concern you? Did you think about that? Were you committed to prove that Apple had a future beyond the groundwork that Steve Jobs had laid. Three trillion dollar market cap. Tim Cook's career has been long and extremely successful from pretty much day one. He eventually made his way to Apple, sure, but to understand Tim and the Apple of today, we need to do a quick look back at how Tim Cook became a force in the industry on his own and why Apple needed him. After graduating college, Tim had earned his stripes early in his career at IBM, where at just 31 years old, he became the director of North American Fulfillment. This was a hard fought battle. We're talking 12 years of service full of pressure, deadlines, shipping concerns, and being a cog in the wheel of Big Blue. But competitors took notice, and soon Tim was offered an opportunity to fix even more problems at another company called Intelligent Electronics. They were in need of his expertise, and of course, Tim rose to the challenge and succeeded, quickly being promoted to COO, Chief Operating Officer. His success bred more success, and soon he found himself entering an executive position at Compaq. Yes, that Compaq. For the easy access button on the Compaq Presaria, we're changing the way you get on the internet. Compact Presario 4800 series with Intel Pentium 2 processor. This was a major break for Tim. He had just reached an incredible level of success. At this point, he's only 37, which compared to the average age of executives in businesses across America is insane. It was somehow just natural to the man. Of course, his education and experience were important, but this was how he operated. Tim Cook had established a dominance over the industry of the time. However, while Tim was blazing his own path, Apple was going through some changes, to put it lightly. Steve Jobs had left Apple in 1985, taking a handful of employees with him to found a new company called Next. That is a whole can of worms on its own. That could be its own video. The point is, at this time in history, Apple is Steveless. Now, Apple moving forward without their charismatic leader pivoted back and forth between strategies. For a while, Apple saw a dominant position in the desktop publishing market. This was thanks to high performing, high price point products that power users were in love with. Eventually, though, competition caught up and Apple found themselves losing ground to IBM, who was able to offer similar performance and functionality for substantially lower prices. You know how it goes. Interestingly enough, there's a chance, given the time frame, that some of the moves and improvements that Tim Cook made during his time at IBM is what gave IBM this edge over Apple eventually. So food for thought. This loss of position led Apple down the rabbit hole of cheaper products, which worked for a time. But then Microsoft hit the market and Windows began establishing a whole different kind of dominance. After a particularly rough patch and only weeks away from actual bankruptcy, Apple purchased Next. Yes, the company made by Steve Jobs after he left Apple, bringing Steve back to Apple onto the board 
as an advisor. Then, to absolutely no one's surprise, the literal force of nature that is Steve Jobs staged a boardroom coup that resulted in Steve returning to the office of CEO. I mean, this is supposed to be a serious video, right? But that is just, come on. Steve Jobs, everybody. Steve and the remnants of Apple started the process of rebuilding, and rebuilding would take a lot of work. Hmm, I wonder which young, stone-cold killer of a businessman they could call. As luck would have it, around 1998, Apple's corporate recruiters were hunting hard, and they inevitably came calling for Tim Cook, because as you know, Tim had already forged a reputation in the industry as a fixer. He was the man who could get the job done, move the mountains, make the deadlines, where others had failed. Tim was needed. And it just so happens in 1998, Apple needed to move mountains. Steve was back, sure, but there was much to be done. The mantle of CEO returned, Steve cleaned house, he ordered over 70% of the company's current product lineup to be cancelled, and in that purge, lost over 3,000 employees. It was brutal. I couldn't even figure out the damn product line after a few weeks. I kept saying, well, what is this model? How does this fit? And I started talking to customers and they couldn't figure it out either. And so you're going to see the product line get much simpler and you're going to see the product line get much better. This was Apple's only path to survival, though. They needed to completely remake themselves. It would be a rough path, but Apple and Steve Jobs were not in a comfortable spot. But Tim was. In 1997, he had already risen to become the VP of Corporate Materials at Compaq, which at the time was one of, if not the biggest computer company in the world. He earned it, and he was comfortable. Apple was relentless. Call after call, time after time, Tim Cook refused the company's recruiters. They had nothing for him. Until, on a long shot, they pleaded with him to meet Steve Jobs. Just once. Well, I'm just thinking I'm going to meet him, and, uh, and all of a sudden he's talking about his strategy and his vision, and what he was doing was going 100% into consumer when everybody else in the industry had decided you couldn't make any money in consumer, so they were headed to servers and storage in the enterprise. And I thought, I'd always thought that following the herd was a, not a good thing. It was a terrible thing to do, right? He was doing something totally different, and he told me a little about the design enough to get me really interested and he was describing what later would be called the iMac yeah. and the way that he talked and the way the chemistry was in the the room it was just he and i and i could tell i can work with him and i looked at the problems apple had and i thought you know i can make a contribution here and working with him and this is the privilege of a lifetime and so all of a sudden, I thought, I'm doing it. <laughs> I'm going for it. And you sort of, you have this voice in your, your ear that says, go west, young man, go west. That meeting, as short as it was, was all that Tim Cook needed to jump ship just six months into the greatest position of his career. He chose Apple. He chose Steve. Did your friends tell you this was not a good idea? Yeah, they thought I was nuts. Uh, they thought it was nuts. As he outright defied the advice of his peers and the people who knew him best, Tim ignored the rational side of his brain that got him this far. He had always been cool and calculating, but now here stood Steve Jobs, the visionary who had already secured a spot in the history books. Could he say no? Could you say no? Could anyone say no to Steve Jobs in that moment? So, Tim joins Apple, ready to take a chance and ready for the biggest test of his career. 
At this stage, Apple is a company caught in a death spiral. They'd gone from annual revenue of $11 billion in 1995 down to less than just $6 billion in 1998 as Tim Cook joined the ranks. Apple was facing the worst years of its existence. The ship was headed straight for the iceberg. The next few months would be pivotal. Tim was brought in as senior vice president for worldwide operations and took Apple's entire supply chain and obliterated it, only to be remade into his own golden standard. See, this is why Tim was needed, because this work wasn't charisma. It wasn't magic. It was intellect and cold math logic. This was Tim Cook's domain. This is where he thrived. Tim Cook was invaluable, indispensable, and the final piece of the puzzle Apple needed, Steve needed, to announce the iMac. The love child of Steve's insight, his courage to pivot the entire industry into unknown waters, and Johnny Ives' eye for breathtaking design. Apple was reborn. The iMac, a massive success in the world of personal computing. The trajectory? was set. Apple had everything it needed. The players were established. The visionary, the designer, and now the operator. Trip Mickle's book, After Steve, does an incredible job of painting a picture of Tim Cook, how he ran his team and himself. At a company that had thrived under Jobs' charisma, Cook quickly proved himself to be the CEO's foil. He was stoic and reserved, seldom showing emotion. He focused on numbers and gorged on spreadsheets. He worked long hours hitting the gym before dawn and working into the evening. He rallied his team behind the Lance Armstrong quote, I don't like to lose, I just despise it. Tim's value to the company was shown immediately. He and his team were an integral force that moved inventory almost as fast as it could be manufactured, forged deals and made connections securing stability and long-term partnerships that without exaggerating, it felt to people that he could either read the pulse of the industry really well or that man was seeing the future. Tim Cook was a ruthless operator. Cook's demanding stoicism created fear. Middle managers screened staff before allowing them to present to Cook to ensure they were deeply knowledgeable about the issues involved. They dreaded wasting Cook's time. If he sensed that someone was insufficiently prepared, he could lose patience and say, next, as he flipped the meeting agenda page. Some people exited meetings in tears. After years of time and time again showing himself to be everything Apple needed him to be, Tim Cook was promoted further to lead of operations in 2005. Of course, not everything in the walled garden was good and golden. Steve was sick. He had been since 2003. We all know this story. Steve had pancreatic cancer. Inevitably, it would keep him from doing and performing his duties as CEO, and eventually would take his life. In 2011, a final medical leave of absence was granted to Steve by Apple's board of directors. During this time, Tim Cook was made responsible for most of Apple's operations while Steve continued to make major decisions. This was his final test. Later in the year after resigning from the position of CEO, Steve Jobs voted to make Tim Cook the next chief executive officer of Apple. He called me one weekend uh, in August of 11, and he said, I'd like to talk. I've been thinking a lot. Apple's never had a professional transition at CEO. Uh, I'm determined that we will have one now. I want you to be the CEO. And just six weeks later, We are interrupting programming this evening because an American Edison has died. Steve Jobs, the chairman of the board of Apple Computer Company, passed away a short time ago. Apple is confirming uh, that Steve Jobs has passed away after a battle with pancreatic cancer. He was an artist who worked in metal and glass, plastic and pixels. And the ideas that live inside his machines completely changed our definition of form and function. 
After surviving pancreatic cancer and a 2009 liver transplant, the 56-year-old founding father of Apple Computer and Pixar Studios died tonight. He is mourned by his wife, four children, and millions around the world who could not wait to see what he would come up with next. When people count all the good that Steve Jobs left us with, we always hear about the products and the innovation, but really, his greatest move, the best thing Steve Jobs could have ever given Apple, could have ever given us, is Tim Cook. Steve was a lot of things. He was complicated, he was smart, and he put so much of himself into Apple. In many ways, the company was an extension of himself. Tim Cook, though incredibly different and wildly unsuited for the role of charismatic, visionary leader, was the only one who could do for Apple what Steve wanted. Even if Steve was never sick, never lost his life from illness, there's an argument to be made that Apple didn't need Steve anymore. The vision, the ideals, they were set. Steve had seen to that over his long saga of instilling his mindset into those around him, his passion. The soul of Steve Jobs is the soul of Apple. Making Tim Cook CEO was not a decision made lightly. It wasn't a throwaway interim decision until a better choice could be found. It was the only path forward. Tim was the only one in Apple that could do for the company what Steve Jobs couldn't. And Jobs trusted Tim Cook to be the one to carry his legacy forward because during that short little meeting oh so many years ago, when Tim chose Apple, he did so by trusting Steve Jobs. I wish I could say that Tim's first years as CEO were easy, but in the eyes of the public, of Apple fans and loyal customer base, Tim was unwelcome, to say the least. Steve Jobs was an easy figure to rally around. He made the whole thing. The way he operated with employees, he was abrasive yet compelling. He delivered keynotes, interviews, and shared his opinions openly and with an easy, charismatic smile. There was no world where Steve wouldn't have had people gathering around him with or without Apple. He was a lightning rod. And though Tim Cook was as ready as he could be to accept the responsibilities of CEO, and he truly was what was best for Apple, millions of people around the world saw this as some accountant, a money man, a corporate stiff, taking the mantle from a visionary. His first few times in front of the crowd for product launches were stiff. Tim was stiff. This wasn't something he was used to. Hell, it wasn't something he seemed made for. People around the world were worried that Apple's era of innovation, of progress, was over. They saw Tim and didn't see someone they felt they could rally behind, the same way they had with Steve. People were already starting to make up their minds. Tim and the rest of Apple, though, were getting ready to prove the world wrong. Of course, the ship was not without its ever-important crew. Johnny Ive and his inspired designs beat like a heart through every product. Apple's design team was very much still around. The creative spark was still there, even if something else, someone else, was missing. The company carried on as it had before the passing of Steve, comforted since many of the products and developments being ushered out still had traces of his guidance in them. iPhone 5, 5S, a handful of iPad models, and even the first generation iPad mini. Things were moving predictably, for the most part. Sales were doing fine, numbers were fine, great even. Still, something was missing. The company had the products, the ecosystem, and Tim saying the right words, but the Apple vibe was missing until in 2014, Apple was setting up to do something everyone thought was behind them, something they weren't capable of doing again. Apple was about to innovate. Good morning. 
At an event in early September, Tim Cook would take the stage like he had in previous years, but this time, something was different. He was confident. He knew what was coming. He didn't just have an ace up his sleeve. He had the whole damn deck. The crowd could feel it, too. There was an electricity in the air not felt since Steve Jobs. Opening the event with the message of Think Different, Apple's slogan for the entirety of Tim Cook's tenure at the company, excitement swelled in the crowd. After all, this auditorium held special meaning for the company, the Flint Center. This was where Steve Jobs unveiled not only the original Mac 30 years prior, but the iMac as well. Birth and rebirth. We have some amazing products to share with you. And we think at the end of the day that you will agree that this too is a very key day for Apple. Instead of opening the event how he had in the past, Tim threw the numbers to the wayside. The sales figures didn't matter at this event. And he just told the audience, everything was great. We have so much to cover today. I'm dispensing with those other than to tell you, everything's great. <laughs> They ate it up. He finally had them in the palm of his hand. And then, against the odds, against the criticism, Apple, Tim Cook, Johnny Ive, and the rest of the company innovated. I don't think you guys realize just how big this event was. This was the event where Tim Cook announced the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus. This was the event that showed us that Apple wasn't done yet. And though Steve got them this far, this iPhone would have never existed under his reign. Just talking about the normal iPhone 6, it was almost an entire inch larger than the previous iPhone 5S at 4.7 inches, straight away demolishing one of the commandments set by Steve Jobs, that the iPhone be sized so anyone could reach the corner with their thumb, that you could use it all one-handed. Steve famously mocked other smartphone manufacturers like Samsung for their giant devices, saying, quote, no one is going to buy a big phone. Yet, here we are. Apple just announced the biggest iPhone ever and an even bigger iPhone in the same breath. The iPhone 6 was the biggest iPhone ever, the iPhone 6 Plus even bigger than that, and together they would become the best-selling smartphone of all time. The iPhone 6 became number one because Apple was no longer in the business of making the perfect product for Apple fans. No, Apple was now in the business of making the perfect product for everyone. Tim Cook had been hard at work establishing relationships with China and many other countries, gathering information from would-be customers from outside the United States, something Steve Jobs had little interest in. Tim wanted to know what everyone wanted. He didn't want to mold the wants and desires of the people to his own. This was business, and it was innovation. Oh, and uh, you should know, this event where they just announced the iPhone 6, wasn't even half over. Apple Pay was also announced and shown off. This would be the start of Apple's dominance in the service industry. And Apple Pay changed the way we pay for things forever. That's it! Maybe, would you like to see it one more time, just in case? Tim took the stage once more at that event though because he had the responsibility to do something he had never done before. He got to show us one more thing. The Apple Watch. We have one more thing. What follows is a lot of things. Apple just announced the first completely new product since the passing of Steve Jobs. It's the birth of yet another industry dominance that even Apple didn't and couldn't anticipate. And it was relief and comfort. 
that Apple wasn't done yet. Tim Cook returns to the stage, the first Apple Watch on his wrist, and is triumphant. He locks eyes with Johnny Ives sitting in the front row of the audience and shows his appreciation. The Apple Watch being years upon years of work from everyone. And in case you don't know or don't realize the significance of the Apple Watch announcement, the Apple Watch would go on to become the best selling watch of all time. Not just smartwatch, of all watches ever. To this day, Apple Watch is still the main driver in iPhone sales, not the other way around. This event at this venue was everything. Birth, rebirth, and now, reinvention. Apple suddenly was heading into a completely new and very exciting direction with Tim Cook proudly at the helm. The influence and legacy of Steve Jobs becoming more of a guiding philosophy than direct involvement. We were about to see what an Apple under Tim Cook would finally look like. the future of wireless audio. Apple saying it is reinventing the wireless headphones. No! What the heck is that? That's a bad Apple. That is insanely pricey. It is. For ear pods with the wires chopped off. iPhone 10R will allow us to deliver the future of the smartphone to even more people. The iPhone 10R is a sick you have confusion in the consumer marketplace, or at least a lack of understanding. Now to a major milestone, Apple becoming the first publicly traded company in the world to hit a trillion dollars in net worth. Um, a 13 digit value mark. Can, can they keep this up? The future of wireless audio. The future of the smartphone to even more people. Can they keep this up? And now it's time for a huge leap forward for the Mac. And a future beyond the groundwork that Steve Jobs had laid. Put it this way, Apple is now as valuable as the four biggest U.S. banks combined. Trillion dollar First company. company to reach the two trillion. Two trillion dollars. Three trillion. Three trillion dollars. Haven't seen it before. Uh, no, it's uh, it, even looking on your screen, it's sort of a shocking thing to see it's three trillion dollars next to one company. We do have one more thing. One more thing. This is a day that's been years in the making. I'm excited to announce an entirely new AR platform with a revolutionary new product. Apple came across as confused, wildly disconnected and disassociated from their users. Introducing Apple Vision Pro. Tim Cook's time, his tenure as CEO of Apple, is coming to an end, sooner probably than you'd think. I wanna talk about that. He has been at Apple for a staggering 25 years, longer than some of you watching have even been alive. There is a chance that some of you watching have never even experienced an Apple with Steve Jobs. Apple under Tim Cook's leadership has done the impossible. Words are failing to describe the level of success here. Believe me, this is us trying. It's just dominance. Again, Apple Watch is the best-selling watch in the world. AirPods are untouchable in their space. Apple's services revenue alone makes more money than half of the countries on the planet. The iPhone XR was so successful that if you think about it, they just dropped the XR branding and that line became the default iPhone, separating it from the Pro models. Apple as a company has been transformed and without taking another 30 minutes to analyze business decisions and numbers and all that stuff, it's just mind blowing. And now, whether you realize it or not, we are entering the last stage of this journey, of Tim Cook's journey at Apple, the last stage of his story. Apple's final large scale project under Tim Cook, Vision Pro, has been announced and will be in our hands soon. This will be the last defining chapter of Tim Cook's legacy. And what I feel is, 
Uncertainty. Uncertainty and maybe trepidation, fear, and why? What we've seen from Tim Cook and what I hope we've been able to show you through this documentary is an entire career of winning. Before coming to Apple and after taking over as CEO, Tim Cook and the company itself has outpaced everyone. And the products coming out from every line in Apple, iPhone, Apple Watch, iPad, Mac, AirPods, all of them have been hits larger than life. But what is this feeling, this uncertainty for the future, the worry for Vision Pro? I mean, you just saw a clip of me doubting Vision Pro the same way everyone doubted every Apple product before it. At the end of the day, what do I know? I'm just, I'm just some dude. I think what I'm feeling is the knowledge that Tim Cook will soon, in the next handful of years, be passing the mantle of Apple's CEO to someone else. Someone he trusts to continue the legacy of Apple, the legacy of Steve Jobs, and now the legacy of Tim Cook. I think we're all realizing how much confidence we actually have in Tim Cook, how much we do trust him with the company that we love, and how scary it is to know that, again, we're going to need to trust his final decision like Steve's before him. So let's watch how this story ends together. How Vision Pro stacks up when it comes out. Who will be the next CEO of Apple? How the chapter of Tim Cook closes. Either way, someone is going to have to be the person to replace Tim Cook. And to whoever that is, good luck.